site so that you can view it later. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, our, our speaker today is Frank Becker. He works for the Wayne County County, Wayne County Extension Service, and um, he runs a very successful and popular IPM scouting program. I've heard a, a lot of farmers uh, rave about this program and how helpful it is to them. So um, sorry, folks in other regions of the state, it is only available around the Wayne Holmes County area. But um, I wanted Frank to talk a little bit today about how he approaches this pest scouting and how you might incorporate some of these ideas as you're assessing your approach to pest management um, and wondering if you're if you're winning or if you're doing things in vain. So um, a couple of things quickly before I turn it over to Frank. Um, please, if you have a question during the discussion, Frank, how do you wanna handle that? I forgot to ask you before we got rolling. Is I can address better? questions as they come up. Yep. Okay. That would be used fine. To it. Um, if you want to unmute and there's a pause and ask it out loud, I think that's okay. If you want to put it in the chat, um, I can kind of help Frank keep an eye on that. And um, so your answer, your question gets answered. So I'm going to turn it over to Frank. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Take it away, Frank. All right. Hopefully I remember how to do this with my uh, share screen. I've not done that in a while. Looks good. All right. Awesome. So uh, IPM, <laughs> um, thanks Cassie for the introduction. Uh, really happy to be here with uh, you all to kind of talk about the IPM program and our approach to IPM. So um, on a very basic sense, um, basically what we're doing is, is, you know, spending time with our farmers, getting out in the field, um, and, and really those two bullet points there is what it all boils down to, right? We're, we're trying to understand um, the relationship or interrelationships among plants, pests, humans, and environment. And then the, the flip side of that, kind of the, the and uh, part of that statement is, is analyzing and calculating economic threshold of pest damage. So, you know, obviously we want to understand what's going on. Um, but the next part of that is, is then making um, some, some, you know, ground on understanding the impact that those pests uh, and diseases have on the crops. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am a Wayne County resident, uh, raised here in Smithville, graduated from OSU ATI twice, actually, with two different associate's degrees, um, graduated from Columbus uh, with a bachelor's in 2020, right out of college, then started working with the IPM program here in Wayne County, um, and then uh, was able to transition into the role as educator here um, in October of 2022. Um, really enjoy working with with the folks in the area. Really appreciate having the resources here that that we have with OARDC and ATI. Um, and just really, really enjoy being able to work with those groups. Um, and, and then as part of my uh, job here, I also got my certified crop advisors uh, license or certification. Hey, Frank, your slides aren't advancing, at least on my screen. Oh, well, yeah. that's interesting. You may have to switch to a reading view. What are you seeing now? No, I still see just the... We're not seeing the presentation. We're just seeing the slide deck. Yep. There you I go. I understand. <laughs> that looks better. Is the uh, the screen still sharing? It is, yeah. It says IPM background now. And then did that advance the slide that you're seeing? Uh, try advancing one more and let's check it. Yeah, I advanced it again and it's not nope. moving. No. Nope. Uh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So let's try this for a second. Well, better to catch it now than halfway through. Yeah, right. <laughs> At least we've got all this on record so we can watch this part oh, again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that Are kind you of seeing my slides now? <laughs> we see your slides in the notes page. And how about now? 
that looks good. Why don't you advance it once just to make sure? Yep, looks good. All right. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> um, so just kind of my background at IPM started with with some of the uh, work I did with my dad. So he actually coordinated the IPM program in Wayne County for about 30 years. Um and through that, got a lot of experience, had a lot of interest in in working with a variety of crops. So part of my FFA project in high school was growing uh, fruits and vegetables and flowers. And so that was really uh, my my intro into some of the specialty crops. Um, but then some of my for, more formal education came in the way of, of working with agronomic crops just uh, because that was experience I didn't have. So looking at the, the Wayne County IPM program, just about every county in the state had an IPM program starting in the in the 1970s. So it was um, a program that that Ohio State got some funding for and and put in place. Uh, just about in every county, somebody or or worked with folks who were already in those counties to implement these IPM programs. So um, during that time, those programs are essentially heavily focused on uh, working with agronomic crops. So like in in Wayne County, we had um, kind of peaked around about 6,000 acres of agronomic crops enrolled uh, throughout like the, the mid 80s. And so basically um, what that's what that number is saying every week, um, the, the IPM program scouted about 6,000 acres of crops. So up until the late 90s or excuse me, the late 80s and early 90s, um, that was kind of the, the deal at that point, basically. Um, that funding started to go away, people started to retire, and statewide, the IPM programs really started to fall apart. What happened here in this area was that around that time, um, the plain community was actually really starting to get, it, to get into produce. And so uh, the, the IPM program here in Wayne County took that opportunity and really rode with it. Um, and that, that's basically what saved our program was being able to work with the Amish uh, fruit and vegetable growers, as well as retaining some of the agronomic crop growers. So as it is today, um, I just did the math on our enrollment uh, here for this year for 2023. Um, and we've continued to increase our acreage just a little bit every year. So this year we're really pushing um, the most acreage we've had in a long time, uh, just under 3000 acres that we'll be scouting every week. And that's split up between agronomic fruit and veg crops um, as well as uh, a nice divide between conventional and uh, I should say conventional and organic. Apologize about that. Conventional and organic. So um, we do have the largest individual insect pest trapping network uh, in the state. So we we deploy on our own roughly about 100 traps to monitor for a variety of pests. Um, our program is is uh, we're well known from the pathologist perspective as being one of the uh, first indication groups for diseases like cucurbit downy mildew. Um, and we do hire some scouts based on our acreage enrollment uh, needs. So what is integrated pest management? Basically, you know, as I mentioned before, we're, we're trying to understand the interrelationship between the pests, the plants and the environment, right? So when we look at at these approaches, we're trying to be sustainable. And, and, and in being sustainable, we're minimizing economic, health and environmental risks. Now, IPM is not organic in its own, right? It's it's not saying that IPM is, is definitely an organic practice. It's not pest eradication. It's not pest control. Our goal here is to make strides in reducing our reliance on pesticides, but find a balance in those systems, right? We're not out spending every cent, every dollar, every ounce of our effort in controlling a pest, but we're we're making sure that we're maintaining that balance between crop productivity and our efforts towards pest management. So just to visualize that, basically our key steps as we go throughout the season, um, first off is to identify, right? We have to identify what's going on in that crop. If we're not able to correctly identify a pest, a disease, a problem, we're never gonna have the opportunity to really make an effective management decision. So identify and monitor is number one, right? And that's 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 got to be there. That's that's our scouting. That's our visiting the farm every week. We have to be able to do that to have an effective IPM program. We also want to evaluate. So we're going to evaluate the time of year, evaluate the purpose of that crop, um, evaluate the weather situation. We have to really 
keep an open mind as to what's happening um, and keep a perspective on all the variables that are included in this situation. We work with our growers on preventative measures. So cultural uh, controls, looking at how they're managing that crop and, and where um, we can make some corrections. Action, so we're looking at um, what, kind of, what kind of corrective actions can we make? What kind of management decisions need to be made? And then monitoring again to make sure those management decisions are doing what we expect them to do. So, right, there's a lot of steps you know, that, that go, and, and there's probably even more than, than is listed on this slide, uh, but we can really boil that down to those five main points, pest prevention, monitoring, decision-making, treatment, and then evaluation. So again, kind of the same slides here, but just wanted to really highlight um, that monitoring, and those are examples of some of the traps we use to monitor the, the spotted wing drosophila trap. There's the peanut butter jar on the left and the uh, brown marmory sink bug trap on the right. Those are so critically important to making timely decisions in terms of management, right? So um, we work with a lot of folks who, who, if we didn't have a trap out on their farm, we, we would have maybe a rough estimate of maybe when a pest is present or maybe a rough estimate on pest population density, but without having that trap there, there's just not a good way to actually know how when and then how many um, a pest is arriving. So when we think about pest prevention, um, there's a few ways to look at this, right? So one way we look at this is, is that healthy plants have fewer problems, then that makes sense. A healthy plant is just gonna be able to withstand some of the pest and disease pressure uh, more so than a plant that may be stressed or uh, you know, a little bit hindered in its, in its health. So we're looking at you know, here, best management practice. Uh, are we planting the right plant for the right conditions? Are we giving that plant the correct amount of water and care? So like uh, in those situations, you know, we're, we're looking at preventing that pest from becoming a problem, not necessarily preventing that pest from entering that system, right? So when we think about pest prevention in, other, in another sense, we can physically exclude pests, uh, be it in, in a greenhouse system or in some vegetable systems where we can use row cover that's not always going to be the case, right? So we kind of have to take a little bit of a different look at pest prevention. Uh, in our homes and schools, right, we can, we can make, and, and buildings and, and uh, businesses, we, we make decisions on not leaving food out. We seal gaps. So we can kind of look at applying some of those practices, but in a, in a different approach in, in our different production systems. Uh, again, one of the, the most important, Important points here is monitoring and identifying pests. As I said, correct identification is required. There's no way around that. Um, and, and frequently, we use the labs here at uh, OARDC in Worcester to correctly identify disease and pest problems, right? Um, and, and making sure that we are, are accurate with those recommendations moving forward. The other aspect of that, especially as it relates to insects and um, we have a lot of growers who, who we work frequently with this on is differentiating between beneficial and harmful. And we get, we'll get into that a little more later, but um, we're, we're oftentimes put in a situation where a grower is, is, is just, you know, uh, very anx anxious about a pest, what they're claiming to find as, as a pest in their field. And, and more often than not, it's some kind of beneficial or, or incidental pest. So uh, just, just being able to differentiate between those two. Um, but all that, you know, said, it, it really helps you make educated management decisions when we're able to identify things correctly. As I mentioned, indication is really important. So using traps to identify pests um, and their population numbers, they're not a control method. So in some cases, we have folks who like to use uh, different traps and they use them as a, as a means to try to control pests. Maybe that can work in a small enough environment more often than not, these traps are not gonna be used to control pests. And, and we're looking at traps that use things like pheromone lures or some traps are based uh, just there on the color, like that yellow sticky card there on the left down in, in that greenhouse uh, bedding plant tray. So when we think about tactics for management, um, these can basically be boiled down into four main categories, right? So we're thinking about cultural controls or cultural management options, physical, and mechanical, 
biological. And then the last thing that we would look to, our last resort, would be using some kind of chemical. When we think about cultural controls, this is how you're managing your production system. So be it a field, a greenhouse, a high tunnel, a uh, garden, you know, whatever the case is, how you manage that area is the culture that you're setting up. So when we think about good crop rotation, good residue management, uh, making sure to remove disease or infested crops, that all comes into cultural control. Uh, physical control. So here again, we get into a little more situation that that better suits like greenhouses and high tunnels. Um, sometimes though, we think about this uh, means a control our management in terms of weeds. You know, sometimes we have to physically remove some weed escapes. Um, biological. Again, we're looking there at some some options um, that we either allow to exist in our production system. You know, they're they're naturally going to exist in the field naturally going to exist in the environment, or in some cases, we can introduce some of those uh, species. And then again, we know what chemical control options are, um, you know, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. So when we visualize an IPM program, um, I, I really like the, the model there um, on the right with the pyramid, and, and there'll be a bigger picture here on the next slide. But when we think about sustainable ag, and plant health management at the core of it is IPM, right? So we're balancing our crop production system with environmental health, with economic situations, and, and really trying to find the balance that best works for us. And, and I'll have a little bit of a talk here later uh, in, this, in this presentation, but it, it's, a, it's a spectrum, right? Not every uh, farm, not every field is gonna be the same. So when we think about IPM, they're on that, that pyramid, um, chart, our cultural controls are foundational to our systems, right? These are our foundational practices, plant selection, sanitations, rotations, what, what the site is like. Um, our next option, our next, you know, as we work up into physical and mechanical and biological, we're starting to intervene a little more. These, as we work up that pyramid, our actions become more reactive, right? We're looking there at where cultural physical or mechanical, we're, we're maybe taking some preventative measures, but as we work up that pyramid, now we're taking reactive approaches and starting to intervene more as the toxicity works uh, up that pyramid, obviously the toxicity increases. So there again, just seeing that prevention practices, our cultural controls, those are just going to be our management decisions, right? And we can make some very impactful management decisions that don't seem too complex, but can make a really big impact on that entire system. Um, and obviously then as you work up uh, that pyramid, we'll see more and more uh, increasing levels of toxicity to the environment. So decision-making, right? So we think how many pests is too many? And I, I like to show this picture to groups because, uh, you know, it's, it's very obvious that seems like too many pests, right? And, and what, what I like to highlight here is that we need to evaluate the entirety of the situation, okay? So for this example, you might see this picture and say, yes, that that is too many pests. And, and I agree, that is too many pests. And the situation here being that that plant is about a six week old, six to eight week old cabbage transplant that was out transplanted in a field in the middle of July. It's like a 95 degree day. Um, and it really only has maybe six or eight true leaves on it. So this plant is going to be stunted to the point where it's not going to be productive. It's, it's really going to cut back on the genetic potential. It's not going to reach that genetic potential as a plant, right? So thinking bigger about that, that system and, and the conditions that exist and the complexities that go along with seeing that amount of pest damage. Now, for those of us who, who work with those crops, you know, we, we obviously uh, made a recommendation a week before this picture was taken that the, that the flea beetles be taken care of, but uh, the, the grower just didn't get to it. Then that was a situation that then existed. So, you know, we go from a crop like that then to something like this. And the picture there on the left um, is a pepper leaf with aphids on it. And this was in about a two acre field. Um, and we found, we found one plant that looks like that. So the question we, we posed to the group would be, do we, do we take a, uh, an approach to this? You know, what kind of approach do we take? Do we spray? Do we treat the field? 
Um, do we spot treat, you know, and in this situation, again, understanding what's happening across that entire field in that production system, knowing that this one plant, there may have been aphids elsewhere, but if we can rogue out that one plant, destroy those aphids, maybe we'll save ourselves some trouble with dealing with a, a um, you know, a spray or, or some kind of chemical application. Um, and, and maybe, you know, we give the, the beneficials an opportunity to go to work uh, on those aphids. There on the right, you know, something like a, a pumpkin field uh, late in this picture was probably about uh, end of September. What's happening here is the cucumber beetles, the spotted cucumber beetles are feeding in a bloom on that pumpkin plant late in September. Is that over threshold? Yes, technically it's over threshold, but understanding where that system is at in terms of its production and its lifespan, something that a, a flower blooming in late September is not gonna produce a pumpkin um, by the end of October, right? So in that situation, we can make a recommendation to the grower that he doesn't have to worry about, about those pests. Some other examples of, of just the complexity that goes along with, with being out and scouting that picture there on the left is obviously troublesome, right? That's a lot of Japanese beetles feeding in those apples. Um, but what we understood about that situation was those apples were bird damaged prior to the Japanese beetles finding them. So yeah, we can go through, knock those Japanese beetles into a soapy bucket of water and, and, and move on with the day. Um, but when it comes down to it, we really should look at the, at the, primary problem not the secondary pest right and then oftentimes what can happen is we get so caught up with the secondary pest that we're not really focusing on the primary problem that allowed that secondary pest um, to be present now we also get into situations like the spotted wing drosophila okay and the spotted wing drosophila is that little fruit fly you see there on the right and basically what's happening with spotted wing, wing drosophila is that unlike their 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 cousins the vinegar fly that that we have on our kitchen counters and, and around the, the trash can, um, they are able to lay eggs into unripe fruit. So a normal fruit fly, the normal vinegar fly has to wait for fruit to become overripe before they can, uh, their, their ovipositor can penetrate into the fruit and lay their eggs. The spotted wing drosophila has a serrated ovipositor, which means they can saw into green fruit, lay their eggs, and then by the time you're picking your fruit, it's ripe and it's ready to be consumed. It's full worms. It's those eggs have hatched. It's full larva. So with something like a pest, like spotted wing drosophila, our threshold is one. Okay. And, and without taking the time to trap and watch for spotted wing drosophila, by the time we realized that they were in a blackberry patch or blueberry patch, it would be too late because all of the fruit would be full of eggs. So that is a situation where, again, we're, we're really, we have to be cognizant of the damage that the pest does to that crop um, and, and how to indicate their presence and how to make a management decision uh, once that, that presence is indicated. So what this comes down to is how much damage are you willing to tolerate, right? Is, and a lot of that depends on the harvestable unit of your crop. You know, if we're working with an agronomic crop, you know, that's going to be different than somebody selling cut flowers, right? So the damage could be on the fruit, the blossom, the stem. And, and a lot of that comes down to what are you trying to market to people and what damage are you willing to accept a little bit, um, you know, maybe more of or less of. So uh, obviously a greater tolerance for pests and damage, maybe in a situation where, um, you know, we're, we're working with a crop that we're feeding back to our livestock and, and a little bit of damage isn't going to, you know, hurt us or, or we're growing something for our own use or we're growing a crop that's going to be processed anyways. And so a little bit of damage isn't, isn't a bad thing, but if we're growing a crop that is going to set out on a, on a store shelf or, or has to be cosmetically superior, obviously we're going to have a lower tolerance for those problems. Okay. So who's determining how many pests are too many, it, be it in your house, your yard, your orchard, uh, your field, your your operation. A lot of times it's our consumers who drive that, right? It's, it's the folks that we're selling our products to. It's the market that's determining, basically determining for us how many pests we're willing to tolerate. We can take a stand. We can, we can set our own standards, but when it comes down to it, it's are we able to sell that crop? Are we able to make money? 
and keep a balance between the efforts that we put into pest management versus the return that we're getting off that crop. Now, when we think about management, control versus management are two terms that we tend to use interchangeably, right? But do they really mean the same thing? Probably not, right? When we think of somebody who says they are controlling cockroaches, my mind goes to they are taking every action possible to eliminate the cockroach problem, right? And and that makes sense. Um, what do we think of someone, you know, who's saying that they're managing a weed problem? Weed control programs and, and often pest control programs, um, you know, the the or I should say weed management or pest management programs, we're looking at balancing the efforts of the our outputs and our expenses um so that they don't they don't you know get get too far uh removed from each other right we're we're trying to balance the effort that we're putting into managing that situation so in this case if someone says they're managing a weed problem they're probably doing what they can to handle it and make it so that 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 field remains productive but they're not putting all their effort into managing that problem so why do we call it integrated pest management not integrated pest control we're not there just to control that pest, right? We're looking at keeping, you know, an, an ecological balance. We're looking at keeping an economic balance in those situations so that we're not removing that pest entirely and we're also not losing money on doing it. So when we think about that, it's easier, cheaper, more efficient to prevent a problem than solve it, right? And we we talk about that with our our proactive controls, not our reactive uh, reactive management decisions, right? So when we think about cultural, it means that we're taking steps to prevent the problem. And we think about that in like integrated plant health management. So there again, there's that spectrum that we can be on. And so the, those bubbles there, chemical, cultural, biological, host resistance, regulatory measures, those are all going to be different sizes for different people based on their crops, based on their production goals, based on their clientele, right? And, and so you know, I guess your take home message here from the from first half of the presentation is the, the everybody's going to be different. Every crop's going to be different. Every spectrum is going to be different in terms of where you put emphasis into your pest control or pest management program. Um, when we think about cultural controls, you know, again, not every system is going to be this easy to exclude a pest, right? We're not going to have greenhouses. We're not going to have low tunnels over our agronomic crops. And, and, and that's fine, but we have to we have to keep in mind those best management practices that give our crops the best opportunity to withstand some of those pest and disease uh, issues. So when we think about cultural um, control, mechanical, biological, right? So we kind of mentioned some of these, but you know, mechanical, you can physically exclude, remove, biological, we're introducing things, and then chemicals, you know, obviously we want to keep our pollinator health in mind. We also want to keep some of our predators in mind, right? So when we think about predatory uh, species in our crops, we really want to take an opportunity to scout thoroughly, not only for the pests, but for their predators. So some of these examples are like ladybugs or lacewing larvas. As we're scouting, we're also noting when we're finding these things. We're noting when we're finding lacewing eggs. We're noting when we're finding ladybug eggs. We want to make sure that we're giving those predators, those parasites, those beneficials credit and give them time to do what they're supposed to do. So one example of this, <clears throat> um, there in that picture, you see that kind of dark brown oval shaped, uh, almost looks like an egg. This is actually a parasitic wasp cocoon that parasitized a alfalfa weevil larva um, and, and then hatched out of the, or it would have created a cocoon inside where the alfalfa weevil larva was also uh, all cocooned up. So as we're scouting alfalfa fields in the spring, uh, we're keeping an eye out for these cocoons because we know if there is the parasitic wasp population present in fields where we're also finding alfalfa weevil, maybe we can you know, kind of cut back on our urgency in terms of a management decision. We can let those beneficials have a little time to see if they can kind of level out the pest populations. So here's just kind of a example of that life cycle. So 
what happens is that adult parasitic wasp lays its eggs into the host, which in this case, the host caterpillar would be the uh, alfalfa weevil larva. As that host caterpillar starts to eat and grow a little bit, the egg hatches the first instar, second instar. All those instars are inside of the caterpillar, actually eating it from the inside out. And then what happens is as that host starts to die, gets gets destroyed from the inside out, the uh, parasitic wasp larva creates a cocoon, it matures into adult, and then the cycle begins again. Now, the other pests that, that we'll find, um, or I shouldn't say pests, the other beneficial we'll find working on pests in, in the uh, alfalfa fields in this situation, was the spine shoulder bug okay and so what you see here in these pictures is the spine shoulder bug is actually um has its mouth part stuck into the alfalfa weevil larva and it's feeding on its juices and and basically eating it uh, um as a meal and so as we're scouting something like that we can often overlook just as an another stink bug right where we're we can, we can very easily overlook it and, and move on with our day. But without taking a closer look at that, that presumed stink bug, it is in that family. But uh, we might have never noticed that it had a alfalfa weevil larva stuck on its mouthpiece. So um, again, just taking an opportunity to look through the fields, understand what beneficials are present. Uh, this series of pictures here, I just stopped in an alfalfa field and looked down. Um, and then I only captured three ladybugs, um, but there was about seven or eight just within a, a two or three foot radius around me. Um, and there again, so we have at this time of year, we had problems with with our alfalfa weevil larva that we're feeding in the alfalfa, but we also had some aphids. Now, as we scouted, the ladybugs were taking care of the aphids and the parasitic wasps and the spine shoulder bugs were taking care of the alfalfa weevil larva. So, uh, you know, there again, just understanding the relationships that not only the pests have with the crops, but that the beneficials and predators have with those pests. Something like a tomato hornworm. And, and for those of you who, who <laughs> vegetable garden or grow commercial vegetables, you know, tomato hornworms can be a big problem. But if you ever find a tomato hornworm that looks like this, it's best to leave it in place. And essentially this is taking um, the same the same life uh, cycle as the uh, parasitic wasp of the alfalfa weevil larva. Basically what's happening um, as that wasp lays its eggs down into the caterpillar, the eggs hatch, they grow, they eat the caterpillar uh, in from the inside out, and then they create a little cocoon um, when they pupate, and then they uh, hatch as wasps. And they continue that life cycle. So if we were to destroy this caterpillar, we would be destroying, you know, easily 30 or 40 um, new beneficial insects. So there again, just making sure that we're keeping in mind to not only scout for the, the pests, but also for the beneficials. So um, the, the challenge here is that it's not going to be consistent every year, right? So some years when we have higher levels of pests, we're really going to draw down um, or we're going to have the opportunity to build up, I should say, the population of beneficials. Now, that's kind of a cat and mouse game, right? Because then conversely, the following year, we may have a low population of pests and not enough resources for the beneficials and predators to stay uh, at their population. So their population will drop. Well, when their population drops, then the pest population can come back up. So we kind of have this cat and mouse game between beneficials between predators and and the pests but um just know that just because one year you're finding a lot of beneficials that's not always going to be the case the following year just based on their their resources that are available to them um when we think about pesticide labels i just want to throw this in there because i wouldn't be a good extension employee if i didn't uh, make sure we're reading the label rei phi really important active ingredients, target species, crop applications. I don't want to spend too much time on that because that's not the point of today, but I just wanted to remind folks that the label is the law. Make sure you're reading the label when you're using any kind of chemicals. 
action threshold and and we'll also talk about economic injury level or the um, economic threshold. So this is the point at which the conditions are appropriate for you to make some kind of management decision. Okay. And and the siting of a single pest is not, unless it's spotted wing drosophila, we're, we're not necessarily going to require action, right? So IPM is based on not just pest indication, but pest population and understanding of, of the entire situation. So we're not out there just making recommendations based on seeing a single pest, a single leaf with disease on it. We really under, want to understand the complexity of that situation. So when we think about these variables, they're very dynamic, right? And, and they're going to depend on a lot of things, crop value, degree of injury, susceptibility, tolerance um, to to having a, a cosmetically inferior fruit, right, or, or, or vegetable, um, cost of recommended control or tactics for the, the target pest, and then presence or absence of populations of natural enemies um, to reduce pest numbers and prevent economic injuries. So that's a very short list, but uh, it really hits the high points in looking at the, the, the variables that we really have to consider each time we go out to scout. So just to visualize that, basically, you know, looking at your, uh, you know, your pest population as it increases, your economic threshold is the time that, that basically that's giving you a little bit of a time to make a management decision before you would face economic injury or economic loss. And that's just allowing that buffer that, you know, it takes time to get out in the field, make an application of something if you need to, um, and, and, and your economic injury level is basically the point at which the cost of your pest management um, is, is no longer, you know, you're losing more money than what it costs to manage the pests. So let's think about this in a, in a decision-making sense. It's nice to think about it in a straightforward sense, right? It, it, it's, it's really, it would make it easy, make it simple. If we could just think about it like that first example, say we're out looking at leaf hoppers we see 0.1 nymphs per leaf. Our injury level is a half a nymph per leaf. So we could say no control is needed. And, and that's a very simple way to do it, right? But in a, you know, in, in a real world situation, how it actually works out, um, in, in this example, right, we're sampling aphids. We could say 20% of our terminals are infested. Well, what is the age of the tree? What is the time of the year? What is the cultivar? Are there predators present? Do we even have chemical options available? Um, and, and you know, there certainly that list could go on. And our decision there would be maybe no control is needed yet, but we should sample again in another week or two weeks. So that's, you know, basically just wanted to highlight that it is complex, right? And it takes time. It takes understanding. And it, it really takes consistency consistency during the year, consistency from year to year. You really want to be able to get that knowledge, get that experience. And what it comes down to is, is having the experience of going out and scouting year over year, right? And, and you're never going to feel like you're confident in your first year. And that's fine. I, I mean, it, that's just how it is. But having that experience from one year to the next, and, and hopefully for, for many years uh, down the road, you're going to build that confidence, you're going to build that understanding of, of that I mean, of the environment that exists around your production system. So just to kind of wrap up, I want to talk about just a few things um, that, that we deal with with the IPM program. And one of it is kind of having to, to look at um, the fall armyworm outbreak that occurred in 2021. And, and I kind of, I like to highlight this because it, it really pushes um, what we need to know and, and all the hats that we need to wear being involved in agriculture. And this one, directly involves looking at meteorology, right? So in August of, of 2021, we started hearing about, um, it actually came in that golf courses were being damaged. And so we were, we were like, okay, you know, there's, there's problems with turf, problems with grass. And then obviously it got into some farm fields and, and messed with some alfalfa and fall seeded uh, grain. So this outbreak lasted until roughly halfway through October. Um, some, some folks say that this was a once in a 30 to 60 year event. Um, others, you know, they couldn't even remember the last time something like this had happened. So just briefly here, I want to cover what is the fall armyworm? Why did the outbreak occur? And what we're kind of doing to prevent another bad outbreak. 
Fall armyworm is an invasive pest basic, basically everywhere it exists. It does not overwinter here. It is a subtropical pest and it has major resistance to BT and chemicals. So feeds on a lot of crops can be a big problem. The fall armyworm is very dependent on temperature for its life cycle. And what you see in this picture is kind of the, the graphic there of, of the life cycle. And basically what we can deduce from those high temperatures that we were experiencing is that we were pushing the quickest intervals possible for all of those uh, life stages. We were just flying through uh, the life cycle just based on our warm temperatures. When we think about identification, we're looking for a couple different things here. Looking at the Y on the head capsule, it's kind of inverted Y, that kind of light brown um, that, that looks like it kind of comes down between the eyes and then across its face. And then we're also looking at the four dots kind of on the tail end of that caterpillar. The important thing here is that and, and unfortunately what we missed is, is scouting, right? And so that time of year, we were not necessarily scouting for Lepidopter and pests to be a problem, which we should have been um, keyed into maybe looking for just because of the warm temperatures, but that just was not typical to be looking too much for lep these Lepidopter and pests, these larvae uh, late in the year. So what happened was all those eggs got laid. By the time we got out and started scouting, that week um those caterpillars probably would have been in that second or third instar stage but realistically um as we were scouting it was 90 degrees it was the heat of the day those little caterpillars were not going to be right out on the top of of the alfalfa or the the uh fields that we were in so they were likely down around the crown of the plant feeding um or or just hiding out for the day waiting for it to cool off by the time we started seeing them they were in this fifth or sixth stage instar, obviously near the end of their life cycle as a as a larva and above that red line. And that red line there is showing basically above the, the third instar. So fourth, fifth and sixth instar, there is no chemical treatment that is going to actually do anything against this this pest. So you know, in, in order for you to make an effective decision against something like fall armyworm, you need to be scouting and catching them early enough that some kind of pet chemical or, or BT spray is going to do its job. The other thing about fall armyworm, and the question here would be which ones are fall armyworm, and it's a trick question because it's all of them, right? So the fall armyworm can be a different color based on the crop that it's feeding it. So there again, having correct identification, slowing down, taking the time to correctly identify this pest maybe could have saved some people a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of lost crop had we not been so caught up in and maybe, you know, what color was this caterpillar because they can be multiple colors. So why did this occur? Um, basically what happened was we think back to that summer and, and on this summer was this past summer, I should say was very similar um, in the setup. Right. And, and so there was this giant, heat dome that they called the ring of fire right and, and it set up over the center of the country as a big high pressure and what happened was all of our storm fronts all of our weather patterns were coming out of the northwest and not coming up from the south and typically what happens is as southern fronts move through the country they disperse a few moths at a time and that's not unusual so what happened in these last two years and especially in 2021 that heat dome just continued to exist until what happened a hurricane came up through the center of the country, blasted that high pressure up, and now the floodgates opened for these thousands and millions of moths that were basically sitting down in, in the Gulf Coast, repopulating, reproducing, you know, building in their population. Now they had free access up through the uh, Ohio River Valley and up into the, the Great Lakes. Um, and so not only did we have that situation happen, then we had really warm temperatures. So August was was three degrees above average. September was about two and a half. October started out 11 degrees above average, average then about seven and a half degrees. So that enabled our second gen generation in October where we were seeing anywhere um, upwards of five to 600 moths per trap per week in those situations. So there again, being able to look at the situations in terms of the weather is really important. So this summer we were all very concerned after we started watching this pattern set up again 
um, in summer 22 that we could face another far more warm outbreak. Now, fortunately, we didn't have uh, the hurricane to break up that high pressure, but nonetheless, still a concerning pattern, something that we will continue to keep an eye on and something that now uh, we will have annual pest monitoring networks from Texas the whole way up into New York to watch for uh, the fall armyworm moth movements and, and hopefully keep an eye on their presence, their population pressure, and keep keep our growers informed as to what's happening. The other the other thing I just want to wrap up here uh, with is, is some problems that we've seen um, that have continued to probably get worse in some situations, and that's weeds. And and so when we think about weed control or weed management, I should say, um, it really comes down to to making some some tough management decisions, right? Are we are we going to rotate out of, of uh, a grain crop for a couple of years? Are we going to um, go into a hay crop? Are we, are we going to have to pull maybe a field out of organic um, and, and make some uh, decisions on, on what to do and then, and then get it recertified. There is some weed problem. There are some weed problems like in these examples here, like the bind weed that there's just not a lot of great options. Right. And so, this situation here on the right was a sweet corn field uh, full of amaranth. And so, you know, there's just some some things to kind of keep on your radar um, with some of the fields we're in. Weed pressure continues to be one of the leading problems in terms of of crop competition. Um, you know, we can do a lot of, of disease and, and pest scouting and, and you know, leave it up to to, to some of the, the environment, leave it up to the beneficials to take control of. But what we can't really leave to the environment is weeds. So we have to be a little bit better in terms of our management, best management practices in terms of getting that field established um, and, and finding some ways to be innovative in terms of weed control. So I just want to wrap up. Why is IPM important, right? We're, we're focused um, on prevention and long-term control or management of these problems. We're, we're trying to limit our react to treatments we're encouraging integrated approaches, okay? We're encouraging uh, being progressive in, in, in adapting different crop production methods, different uh, crop management methods. So cover crops, resistant crop varieties, crop rotations, beneficial insects. We wanna reduce the need for pesticides and then in the end, reduce the amount of money that we're spending on that crop and hopefully increasing our farm profitability. How can you implement your IPM program uh, or, or what can you do to implement IPM on your farm, in your operation? Scout your crops. And I, and I tell this to everybody, regardless of the field type, size, crop type, you know, be it your garden, your flower bed, you have to scout to know what's going on. It's just like getting a soil test. We can't make good uh, soil fertility recommendations without having a soil test. We can't make good crop uh, or... or um, plant health management recommendations without um, actually scouting our crop. Uh, you can work with certified crop advisors, work with extension, lots of folks out there to help you with IPM. And, and really keep in mind what integrated means. And that's, that's really the key to having a successful IPM program. We have to keep in mind that it, we're not going to find, out of all those methods, we're not going to find one that does it all for us, right? We have to be willing to try new things, be willing to accept that we might have to do something more than once, but be be mindful that you have to do a lot of those things together to have an effective IPM program. So with that, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Let me stop sharing here. Anybody has any questions? We had a couple in the chat while you were talking. Um, sure. Are, well, and I, I had a question along this lines too. Um, just uh, are there some resources you would share to um, provide guidelines for thresholds? Um, where where can where can a grower go if they don't live in your area and can bother you? Yep, great question. So I know that um, the Ohio, there's there's our IPM program in the county, but then we also have Ohio State statewide IPM program that's uh, led by Jim Jasinski. And I, I know that they um, had a listing and I, I have the, the hard copy document. I'd be happy to, 
to send that out, Cassie, if I could send that to you and, and maybe you distribute with folks if they're interested, but it's basically just a listing of the thresholds that, that Celeste Welty and a few other folks went through and, and did all the math on, which I really appreciate that, that they did that, it saves us a lot of time, uh, but it's just a quick, easy guide and, and I would be happy to distribute that. Uh, but otherwise, just just some resources online. Um, I know that like Ohio State doesn't always have the best resources online, but but other universities like Purdue or Penn State, Michigan State, um, you know, make sure that as you're looking at at thresholds, try to stay in this area um, around the Great Lakes Midwest. Um, sometimes as you start to venture into other land grants outside of this area, the thresholds change a little bit just based on on their uh, different environment. So. Yep, I would be happy to share that with y'all, um, and I can send that to you, Cassie, if, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah, if you're not already getting um, reminders of these events and you would like to receive reminders, or if you would like to receive the materials Frank just talked about, just um, stick your email or contact information in the chat, and I will follow up on that. Um, fr uh, Frank, Doug had a question about what percentage of the farms or acres that you serve um, in this area are organic. Yep. So I would, I would say about a third. So we work with, um, some certified organic, uh, agronomic farms and then some, uh, certified organic vegetable farms. And, and, and so roughly about a third of the farms that we work with are organic and, and, you know, certainly we, we do our best to work with like Greenfield Farms, who's in the area here and, and try to work with them and, and help their growers as much we can. So we participate in their crop walks and, and their uh, field nights and things uh, of that nature. And so, um, you know, try to maintain that balance between between the conventional and organic folks and and uh, want to be a resource to them. But, uh, you know, many of the orchards um, that we work with, you know, that they, they really have, have moved towards conventional and 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 just in in their need to to produce that cosmetically superior fruit that that the schools are looking for that that some of their larger commercial producer or commercial buyers are looking for um, they've really struggled to maintain some of their organic practices so yeah but roughly about a third though of, of who we work with is organic. Um, Brian's got a question in here. How do IPM programs interact with faculty on communicating potential research topics and needs? Yeah, so like our IPM program, we're in constant contact with with like the pathology lab with our with our researchers. Um, you know, getting them getting those folks out to crop walks and and growers meetings. Um, you know, getting them out on the farms. Um, and keeping them involved with the growers is really important for us and, and really important for the growers too, to see those people. It really means a lot to them. Um, but also, you know, by, by us taking samples um, and, and taking questions back to the researchers, they can kind of get a, an understanding of what's going on in the community. What's, what's the challenges, you know, that are being faced by the growers and, um, you know, really trying to be that, you know, that's the role of extension, right? Be the, be the, um, connection between our research community and our and our um, stakeholders. And so that's really the, 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 the niche that we try to fill. That uh, plant pest diagnostic clinic is available to the public, correct? Correct. Okay. I wanted to check before I dropped the link in there, but um, I will do so. And then like the fruit and vegetable pathology lab, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to say for sure that, that the other labs are not, um, but I know that, like the fruit and veg pathology pathology lab get money from the Ohio Produce Growers and Marketers Association to process samples for free. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if if the agronomic crops folks are the same way, um, but, you know, certainly work with extension offices if you need to get samples processed and and the labs that we have are are, are really top notch about getting results to you. And do they go directly to the lab or do they, should they work through a county extension person? You could, you could go directly to the lab if you're close enough. Um, if, if you're not, it would be not a problem for the county person to be the, the contact person for you. Other questions for Frank out there? Any ID resources that you would recommend? Oh man, I'm sitting here in my desk full of books. Um, honestly, if you like to be like a little bit geeked out like me and you have a little bit of, of dough laying around the APS net or the APS, the, the American Pathological Society 
compendiums are, I mean, really good, really good pictures, very technical. Um, for, for insects, the, there's a book called Garden Insects of North America by Whitney Cranshaw and Dave Shetler, which is a really, I mean, very comprehensive insect guide. Um, yeah, there, there's a, <laughs> there's another book. Um, it's called the vegetable diseases of Canada. And it's, I mean, it's a huge book. And if, if you can find them, they're really excellent. Um, but otherwise, you know, there's, there's just an immense amount of, of guides, especially for weeds. Um, you know, the, the, there's a weed guide here in the uh, weeds of the Midwest United States and central Canada, really good pictures shows you the seedlings, the seeds, um, reproductive stages of the weeds. So, I think as you're looking at guides, you know, finding thing, finding the guides that really are comprehensive in, in that sense are, are really uh, can be very helpful. Julia, I see you got your hand up. Can I get Eli's question in here quick? Um, yeah. Which is a question I've asked too. How do we get back to having programs like yours in every county? <laughs> so I would start talking to your county educator and, and just trying to get that bug in their ear um, you know, and, and certainly I, I realize that some of the concern can come from funding and, and trying to figure out how to, you know, fortunately we can continue to maintain our program because we have the volume of farms, excuse me, that we carry with us in our program and we're able to hire folks and, and pay for their mileage and, and so on. And so, um, some of it comes just from getting that initial starting point. Right. And so I think that working with your County educator, and having a conversation with them that you feel that's very important that that maybe you and a couple other folks in your county could really benefit from that is is a great starting point and based on that um you know that conversation can go up the ladder to the state ipm program to the state uh a and r program and and see what kind of funding opportunities that that are there to help kind of jump start a program and 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 i agree it really would be nice to to see this replicated in other counties and i'm certainly you know, always available to, to, you know, help talk folks through that and, and be a resource to, to advocate for you. Um, but it would really just start with having that conversation with the county uh, educator and the county extension program and, and see where it goes from there. Julia, go for it. Are you seeing any tools emerging that um, growers that don't have access to IPM programs are effectively using? That's a great question, Brian. And, and I can't say that I really do. Um, I know a lot of a lot of the folks that have actually come back to the IPM program who were once on it, um, you know, they had started working with like their co-op and, and trying to just, um, you know, go with the programs that were being offered to them. And they found those to be very expensive and not necessarily always required, right? We know that not every year you're going to have the same pest or disease pressure. And if if that program is just being deployed every year, um, you know, we can see where obviously the economics of the situation don't play out. So, you know, I think for some folks, they're, they're a little bit on an island because they don't really know where to go. They can find resources online, um, but, but really not having uh, resources there or, or somebody there to walk walk them through things it, it makes it a little bit difficult so that's a good question and, and brian i don't i don't know that i have a great answer to that anything else quickly that we can deal with <laughs> frank um in general are do county extension folks in those offices do they are they usually pretty knowledgeable in this area and like making recommendations or um, they're not going to tell people to jump straight to chemicals, <laughs> which right, is important that's, for this group. <laughs> yep. That's a great question. And and I'm not going to speak for everybody because I'm not going to say it's a hundred percent, but I would, I would based on, on my interactions with the County educators, a lot of them are very cognizant of that. Right. And, and, and if they don't know, an answer they're going to do their best to find it out for you and so i think that what what we're finding is that county educators um who are, are are new who maybe are new to their county they really want to learn more about ipm they want to learn more about 
uh, managing pests in a way that's responsible or or that's that's environmentally friendly, finding that balance in a field or in a production system. So I think that that the potential, it, there's a huge upside to this, right? There's a, the, the, the room to grow is enormous. And, and so now is a really good time to have, be having those conversations. Um, but, but in the same sense, we're all really limited with our time, right? We're generalists. We have to, we have to balance our time with, with the needs of the county. And so, um, you know, just keeping that in mind that, that not every educator is going to have the amount of time that they can dedicate to an, a, a full-scale IPM program, but they might be willing to work with your farm a couple times throughout the summer um, and, and walk you through some things. So, you know, that that's kind of the balance that unfortunately in extension and, and being that every county is a little different, that that commitment to something like a, a, a full-scale IPM program isn't, it just sometimes isn't always going to be feasible. Cool. Well, thank you, Frank. Appreciate that and appreciate everyone who, uh, who got on on here today. Um, our topic next month is some summer lettuce trials from Franklinton Farms, right, Denise? Okay, <laughs> make sure I remembered that right. Um, so I'll be sending out some more information about that and a reminder, and we meet every month um, on the first Thursday at noon. So feel free to join us. I think in June, we are gonna just kind of have a planning meeting and um, talk a little bit about what's to come and what else we can do with this group. So if you're interested in being part of that conversation, we would invite anyone to come and, and put in their two cents then. So thank you again, everyone, and especially to Frank, and uh, hope to see many of you next month. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, everybody. Bye.